everybody. Um, so I guess some of you saw um, Jeff Massa come in earlier. Um, I work for him at a company called Untap. Um, it's a really small company. There's only eight of us. Um, we're hiring now and we're going to growing to 13 people. Um, I do software engineering, product development, uh, strategy, digital marketing, um, all sorts of different stuff. Uh, Jeff asked me to come and talk to you guys about what I do and how I ended up doing it and how I got a job. So I'm going to go over what Untap does and why, um, how I got my first job and how I think I might have done it differently if I had known then what I do now um, and maybe help you guys out when it comes to that. And then just talk about a couple other things that are happening in technology that I think are really interesting and important and then uh, afterwards you guys can ask questions. I can go into more detail about something um, that I've covered or we can talk about something totally different or whatever you think. So, who am I and why should you pay attention to me? Um, <laughs> I graduated from NYU two years ago, um, like as of last week, which is really terrifying. Um, so I'm not that much older than you, but I've been through college, I've been out of college for two years. I have gotten a job at a software company and I've worked there for a while and I've seen stuff go right and stuff go wrong. And I made a lot of mistakes in college and um, you know, in my career so far that maybe I can help you guys to not make by telling you about them. So that's why. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what Untapped is um, and why we exist. So this is, uh, this is a deck that we give to uh, potential clients. Um, so. Seeing this would be a hiring manager, so someone who does interviews and tries to fill technology positions at a financial services company like a bank or a hedge fund or something like that. So what's happening in the market right now is there are a lot more jobs than people for software engineers. And there are a lot of recruiters who use tools like LinkedIn and cold calls to try to find candidates to fill these positions. And then they charge the companies they're placing the candidates in, generally something like 25% of a year's salary of who they're placing. Um, so with the market the way it is, that's like $35,000 on average, right? And all they do is they make phone call, well they make 50 phone calls and they get two back. Um, they hook someone up for an interview, and if the person gets a job, they make $35,000. Right? So that's totally ridiculous. And we said, we can do that better with a technology platform um, that is more focused on the candidate side, um, that people like more. Nobody likes when these recruiters call. I get one email about every day from one bugging me asking me if I want to work at X company or Y company, and I never want to respond. So, how Untapped works. It's a, it's a digital platform, so the services we provide to our clients are, we do marketing for you. So you put your role up on our platform, and we help establish or improve your company's brand. Uh, maybe you're a hedge fund that nobody knows about. Um, hedge funds are highly regulated in terms of how they can advertise, so they often don't have very strong brands. Even though there's really, really interesting technology work happening at them and there's cool companies, nobody knows about them. So we work with our clients to improve their brand and market their roles. Then candidates see your jobs that match to them based on technology skills and they apply through our platform uh, and you see their resume. Um, and you can decide if you want to sample a resume, do you want to interview them or not. Um, and you get a simple little interface um, that uh, shows you who you have in your pipeline, this is what your jobs look like. And then when people apply, you can look at their resume, decide if you want to talk to them or not. Um, why I'm tapped and not a recruiter. So, here's the stuff. Like it's untapped makes it easier to recruit and entertain top talent by directly connecting companies with specially skilled, highly coveted candidates, offering a simple, quick, interactive tool. So what we said is we can get you more people who are better for cheaper and faster. So uh, if, an, if, uh, if you're sitting in a hiring manager and someone tells you, uh, I can do an existing business process that you have, but I can do it better, cheaper, and faster, um, they're going to give you a try. Because, uh, do you guys, have you heard of the good, cheap, fast triangle? You can erase any of that. It's physics. Nobody, you know. <laughs> That's all Schlosser. <laughs> This is actually something I learned about in theater school, but it's out of here. So the triangle is good, cheap, and fast. What we always say is you can pick two of them. Does that make sense? You can have something that's awesome, you can have it cheap, but it's going to take a long time. You can have something cheap, you can have it tomorrow, it's not going to be good. 
you can have something good, and you can have it tomorrow, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Right? So what we go and tell our clients is that we can make all three better, um, and they say, okay, great. So then we say, uh, we have candidates that are global, you can hire East Coast of the United States, West Coast of the United States, Eastern Europe, Asia, or wherever you want. Um, because unlike a recruiter who only calls people in one geographic location, we do digital marketing, and if I want to advertise people in Eastern Europe, all I have to do is click a few buttons, and then people start seeing untapped ads in Eastern Europe. So fundamentally, the way this breaks down and the way I explain it to people is there's three parts. There's the manager's side of the platform where people post their jobs. Um, you have you set statistics about how they're doing. There's the candidate platform where people see ads on Facebook, LinkedIn, places like that. They see our jobs. Um, they see improved client branding. And then there's this engine in the middle that uses analytics and tools um, to make connections, market roles internally to candidates, and provide us internal insight into our market. Because it really is like a marketplace. So that's what Untap does. It's a quick overview. Um, we can come back to this after. I want to go through something that Mr. Myers asked me to talk to you about which is how to get a job as a developer. So I spent a lot of time thinking about what to say to you guys about this, um, because I spend a lot of time thinking about this at work. And actually, just to answer this question, it's really, really easy. Learn to code, right? If you guys want to hear more about what programming languages or whatever, what technology is in your demand, I can tell you what the true answer is, they all are. Practice interviewing. Uh, it shouldn't be this way, but interviewing is a different skill than being in a job, right? And I messed up a lot of interviews before I realized this, and then realized I had to actually prepare for the interviews. Even though I'm a really, really good engineer, I was getting rejected. So I can talk more about that. There's a book called Cracking the Coding Interview. Um, that will help out a lot. Another skill that's different than doing your job and different than interviewing is negotiating, right? You get to the point where you think you might want to work somewhere, they might want to hire you, and you have to figure out how much they're going to pay you. And that's always an interesting position because this is like your future colleague, but you're honestly sort of adversaries for a brief moment as you're trying to settle on your compensation. I'm going to talk more about that later also. Uh, and that's really, it's very straightforward. There are so many jobs in technology right now, and there are not enough people for them. So if you can code, and you can pass an interview, and you can negotiate a salary, So the real question, how do you get the right job? So I actually studied design and technology for the theater, as well as computer science at NYU. I've worked on Broadway, off-Broadway. I've worked on film sets. Um, I've worked in corporate events, stuff like that. Um, and it took me a really long time to decide that that's not actually what I wanted to do. Um, so I thought I might go through the way now I think about doing the right job. So it's an iterative process means you're not going to figure it out the first time. <coughs> Which means you guys can just start thinking about it now. Um, the sooner you start figuring out exactly what it is that you actually like to do, and whether or not someone will pay you for it, the better. So, since I'm an engineer and I like flowcharts, I'm going to just give you an example. So, the first step in the process, think about something you like doing. Okay? We don't do that. Then ask yourself, is anybody going to pay you to do that? The answer is no, you should go back to step one. <laughs> if the answer is yes, ask yourself again, are they going to pay you enough to do that? Right? And now, this is like not a straightforward question, right? Because enough for me might not be enough for you, it might not be enough for you. It really depends on how much you like doing said thing and how much you care about how much you make. Right? So that's not like a black or white thing, it's different for everybody. You really have to think about what it means to you. If it turns out they will actually pay you enough to do it, then you should do that for a little while. Right? And you should try it out. You should see how you feel. You should ask yourself, are you happy? Um, do you get home every day from work thinking, I really don't want to go there tomorrow. I uh, hate my boss. Um, that was terrible. Or do you realize that it's 6 o'clock and it's time to go home and you don't even remember what happened today? Because if that happens every single day, you have a pretty awesome job. It's about the same thing. Um, and once again, a lot, a lot of really personal variables in this question, right? Are you happy about how much you get paid? And is that what's important to you? Or are you happy about the fact that you really love what you're doing? 
and it's some combination of all those factors. So if you decide, yes, I am happy and I'm making enough money, then that's awesome. You should really keep doing that. You should stop until this changes, which it will. When I was you guys' age, all I wanted to do was work on Broadway, nothing else. That was everything that mattered to me. So I did that for a while. Uh, and I did work on Broadway multiple times. And then I realized, actually, I'm really unhappy doing this because I work 18 hours a day, six days a week, and I don't know what a weekend is. Um, I'd really like to find out. So, <laughs> so then I thought of something else that I like doing. Um, and I got, got a job as an engineer where I work Monday to Friday. Um, and I get to hang out on the weekends. And I like to sail boats, so I do that. And I'm much happier. So obviously, if you're not happy, So that's what I think about how to get the right job. Um, I hope this is helpful. <laughs> I'm stealing it. It's awesome. <laughs> then there's just a few things that like I wish people had told me. Um, they're somewhat random, so I'm gonna tell you. And I was thinking of them like, on the train. I'm gonna put up a slide that has a stupid buzzword on it, but it's actually not a stupid buzzword. But I'm just gonna tell you that. So the stupid buzzword is critical thinking. <laughs> Um, I'm going to give you an example of this. Unfortunately, this isn't actually a real example. It's one from the internet. But I can tell you that I had an identical real business problem exactly like this at an app um, that you could put on top of it one to one. So this isn't something that is just like made up. I can't tell you the actual statistic that was involved at the time, but it's exactly the same. So say you're at work and uh, someone says, we need to know how much law school graduates make in their first job out of law school, right? And you say, okay, um, I can figure that out. They taught me what a median was in college, right? So you get a bunch of law school salaries and you put them in Excel. And you say, hey, Excel, what's the median? It tells you the median is $62,000, class of 2006. So does that mean that if I give you a bunch of lawyers that most of them make $62,000? No. Does anyone know what the next slide is? Of the standard deviation? Close. It's more complicated than that. When you look at the real distribution, it's what we call bimodal. This is the distribution. So this is salaries, and this is percentage of people that have that salary in their first job out of law school. Right? So if you're taking calculus, the area under this curve is 100%. Right? So as you can see, here's the median, but only 5% of people actually make the median because this is what's called a bimodal distribution, right? What you've got is a bunch of people who get jobs at Big Law, right, in Manhattan, and they make $135,000. And you've got everybody else who doesn't get a job at Big Law, right? They're ADAs or they work in nonprofit or whatever, and their median is $35,000. So actually this median of $62,000 is completely meaningless in this statistic. Right? And this happens all the time. You just hear statistics thrown out on CNN and the news and whatever. And you have to look a level deeper into the statistic. Right? You have to say, okay, what's the actual distribution? What does it look like? What's the standard deviation? Um, is it bimodal? You can't just hear this median number and say, okay, that means I'm gonna make a business decision based on this, right? I could have made a business decision based on my equivalent number, and it would have been really bad if I had done that would have lost a lot of money. So anytime you hear a statistic, just look one level deeper. And that plays into this quote. So this is said by Eric Schmidt, who's the CEO of Google. Every two days now, we create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up until 2003. Just think about that. In two days, the world produces the same amount of information as they did in countless millennia, right? There's a lot of questions now that are being asked now that this has happened because the world has never experienced this much data being produced before. And I've experienced this too, I was shocked. My company is small, there's only eight of us. Um, our revenue's not that high, we're not Google, but we make a lot of data. There's way more of it than I thought there was gonna be, even at a small eight person store. So, what can we do with this data, right? How can we look at distributions like that and make business decisions and policy decisions based on this? 
How do we do that? What should we do with this data? Right? I'm sure you've all heard about privacy concerns on Facebook and things like that. Um, lawyers spend a lot of time talking about this, right? Like, just because you have something, uh, what can you do with it? What can't you do with it? What's ethical? What's unethical? Uh, just because I can look at data we have and use it to make money, does that mean it's okay? Am I breaking a law? Am I not breaking a law? Should I be breaking a law? So why? Right? And so these are two very different things you could spend your entire life talking about, right? This is highly technical and requires a lot of math and engineering and science and all that stuff. And this is like, this is like ethics, right? And uh, the human condition and what is it okay to do? And um, like I said, lawyers spend a lot of time talking about this, but they're intimately related, right? So you guys are growing up in a time when this question is like, we don't know the answer to this question. Right? People are still trying to figure out what's okay to do and why. So I'm going to give you another example like the lawyer salary example, but I'm going to leave you on your own to figure out what it means. The U.S. unemployment rate in March of 2015 was 5.5%. So that means a little over 1 in 20 people in the United States do not have a job. And it's actually higher than this because this statistic only includes people who are actively looking for jobs. Right, so that's an example of you hear a statistic like 5.5%, you have to say, okay, what does that actually mean? Right? 5.5% 5 5 of what? So it's actually a lot higher than this in reality. Every year in the United States, 40,000 people graduate with computer science degrees. Okay? And every year in the United States, there are 4 million new jobs for people need computer science degrees. So I think you can all like put these three things together and figure out what it means, right? It's pretty crazy. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is this. How much will I get paid? Um, because I found myself in the position of being 22 and negotiating this offer and having absolutely no idea what I was talking about and not knowing if I was getting ripped off and didn't really have anybody other than Google to turn to. Um, and I'm not going to get into like the specifics of what your salary should be or how much of a percentage of a company you should be given because by the time you guys are looking for jobs, it's all going to be different anyway. But thank you so much. So there's like a lot of words that you have to learn that are all related to compensation. Capital gain, tax benefits, bonus means tax mutual, dilution, lift salary, liquidation preferences, bonuses, bonuses, equity, alternative minimum tax. Vesting periods, restricting stock, income tax, option agreements, option strike price, instead of stock options, non-qualified stock options, restricted stock units, millions of things, right? Um, and you can like Google all of what this means. I don't really like telling people facts anymore because I feel like with Wikipedia you're not interested. Um, but what I want to do is break down how much you'll get paid into two very basic pieces. There's option A which is you get a salary. And that means you're gonna get paid every two weeks no matter what, right? When you're running a business, you make payroll before anything. You pay your employees no matter what. If you can't pay your employees, you, gotta, you, gotta, you have to fire people, right? Or you have to fix your business. But you pay yourself last as a CEO, right? And you pay rent last, and you pay your vendors last, you pay your employees first. So if you're an employee and you have a salary, you're gonna get your paycheck every two weeks. But that comes at a cost. You're actually trading earning potential for that security, okay? Because you know that every two weeks you're going to get paid. Your employer is going to pay you less, right? And this is something that people like don't really talk about because there are a lot of really high-paying salary positions in this field. But fundamentally, you're getting paid less because you have a security. As an employer, when you're trying to figure out somebody's salary, you should expect a 10 times return on their salary. So that means if I work at Google and I hire a software engineer and I pay them $100,000, I need them to make me a million dollars a year. Okay? So it's a, it's a really big trade-off because you're making this company a million dollars a year and they're paying you $100,000 a year. But you know you're getting your $100,000. You're going to get it no matter what. Option B um, is equity, right? Or freelancing or whatever. It means you might not get paid this month. Right? But if you do, you're going to get paid on your own terms, and you're going to decide what your value is. 
and it's a lot higher than if you have a salary because you might not get it. And your employers will know this, and they're not going to give you benefits, they're not going to give you health care, blah, blah, blah. They're going to pay you a lot more money. And really, what all this boils down to uh, is risk, right? So, how much risk am I willing to take? Now, there's opportunities to be like on that spectrum. It's not one or the other. In fact, I am in the middle of that spectrum. I get paid a salary, but I also have equity in my company. So I've sort of like settled in the middle somewhere, right? Because I like getting paid every two weeks. It's really nice. It's, it's good stuff. It means you get to like have a good time. Um, but also, I'm young, and if the company falls apart, I go to another job. I don't have kids. I don't have a wife. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have any of that stuff, right? So my appetite for risk is fairly high. So I pick something in the middle. Um, and this is the biggest thing you have to think about when you're deciding how you're going to get paid and what your sort of employment situation is going to be. So that's all the stuff that I just wanted to say to you guys. Um, do you have any questions about any of this? Or we can talk about more stuff that like, I haven't covered. We can talk about what technology is in demand. We can talk about cool stuff that's happening in technology. Who's got Saw my profile on AngelList, emailed me and said, hey, do you want to come interview to work for my company? And this is after like two months of looking for a job and doing really poorly interviews and just really starting to figure it out. So I get this email saying, hey, do you want to come interview at my company? And I went in for one interview. And then two days later, I went in for another interview. And then on Monday, I had a contract, a full-time job. So it happens very quickly. Yeah. What is your uh, average work day like? Um um, mine's probably weirder than most people's. Um, if you work at a bigger company, you're going to have a much more focused job. Like you're going to be a software engineer and be a digital marketer. Um, at Untapped, I kind of do a lot of different things. So I come into work around nine or ten or later, um, and I check my email. I see what meetings I have that day. I look at marketing statistics from the day before and the week before. Um, how our digital marketing campaigns are performing. I am in communication with account managers, the various platforms we use, and they help me optimize um, for our costs, and I work with someone else on top of on that. Um, and then I work on new ads, new creative, new images, new things like that, new methods of targeting people and acquiring users. Um, then I also sit down and write code. So there's like deadlines, there's this new feature that needs to be built and it needs to be released to the public um, by a certain date. Um, in the web space right now, the whole idea of like releases and versions of software has really gone out the door. Um, what we do um, is much more iterative, so we make small changes and we release them to the internet all the time. Like you guys notice, um, like something on your Facebook timeline will change, right? And everybody will be really angry. Uh, and they do that. They do that continually. Um, and in fact, they do that in a really cool way. They it's random, but they uh, they have so many. Users. Most companies have what's called a quality assurance team. So they have people that work for them that use their software to make sure it's okay. Um, Facebook doesn't have that. Uh, when they have a new feature, they just say, okay, we'll show this to like 100,000 people um, and we'll see if it works. Right? And they segment a portion of their traffic and they show it to just 100,000 people. Like right now, my colleague actually gets a different ads manager interface on Facebook than I do because it's been like segmented and it doesn't really work that well. Um, and if it breaks, they like pull it out quickly. And if it, fine, and they roll out to the rest of the population. Um, so I do that, and then I also do like product development, right? So not how are we going to build the thing that we need next, but what is the next thing that we need after that, and why do we need it? Um, and I look at data like that, and I make those business decisions. So yeah, all of that in one day. <laughs> okay, I'll go while everyone is brainstorming. <laughs> I'm asking everybody this question. 
what is your favorite part of, I'd say, your experience would be working for a startup and getting into it, like, obviously very early in the startup's life? Yeah, um, what is my favorite part? There's a lot of things that are awesome. Um, I ended up in a really cool situation, which is that I was the first employee at a well-funded company. So I was able to get a job where I was the first person there, and I built it from the ground up, but I also had fairly low risk because they had raised a bunch of money and I got paid a nice salary. And I also got equity, so I have a vested interest in the company. So that's the coolest thing for me about working at an early stage startup. That means that I get to basically see what it's like to run a business, um, but, and I hope Jeff never watches this, but and I, get, I get paid to make the mistakes that I make at work instead of spending my own money making them if it were my business, right? Um, so my company has paid me to make a lot of mistakes um, that I'm not going <laughs> I'm going to ask another one then. Uh, what is, would you say, has the, been the most challenging part, especially about switching kind of paths like you did? What was the most challenging piece of that? Um, it's really like, so, so my career in the theater was like actually very established. I worked with some of the best designers in the entire world. Um, I worked on Broadway. Um, I actually got paid quite well to do it. Um, and like really like my whole career was like laid out in front of me. Um, but yet at the same time, I was really unhappy. And this happened to my boss too, he was at JP Morgan. You can definitely end up in a situation where you're actually really, really good at what you do. Potentially one of the best people in the entire world at what you do, but like you absolutely hate it, right? And then you have to A, figure out what you're gonna do next. And I figured that out by like going to Europe for three weeks and not thinking about it. Um, and then B, once you've like made a decision, you have to tell all the people who you have these close relationships with that, you know, actually I'm not gonna do this anymore. I'm gonna go do this other thing, right? And then they're all gonna say to you, but you're so amazing at this, right? Like, why, why would you leave? You say, well, actually, I'm really unhappy. It turns out actually that when you leave the theater, most people like congratulate you. What do you, what do you 